Hey, what's happening, everybody? Sabu and Notcha here, and welcome to Every Nation Bryanston Online. Hey, thank you for taking an hour out of your week to spend time with us. We have been praying that this time will be impactful for you, and hopefully it can help you to know God and make Him known. Hey, uh, if you're a guest here, maybe it's your first or second time here and you've never filled out our connection card, hey, it'll take you one minute. Click on the connection card below this video. If you're watching on YouTube or maybe on the chat online uh, platform, you can click on to the link appearing on our chat box right now. And we will be in touch with you during the week to connect with you, but also find ways that we can serve you or connect you to our greater every nation, Bryanston family. Right at the bottom of the card, it'll give you three different charities that you can choose from. And we, as Every Nation Bryanson, will donate a hundred grand gift to a charity of your choice just because you tuned in today. And again, to you, welcome. Hey, before we get into the word today, I want to remind you of a few things that are happening in our church family. First being on the 31st of October, during our Sunday in-person service, we're going to be having baptisms. So if you are interested in getting baptized or you want to know more about being baptized, we would love to help you with that. Please click on the link uh, of our baptism link and uh, sign your details and we will make sure to get back to you and connect you. We can't wait to help you be baptized in your journey of following Jesus faithfully. And I think it's going to be an experience that is life changing for you. Secondly, uh, ladies, we still have our ladies evening coming up on Friday. If you haven't signed up, click on the link. Make sure you're there. And uh, we're looking forward to having a blast with you. At least the ladies are looking forward to having a blast with you. I won't be there. I'll be watching the kids. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that too. Uh, then I want to remind you of our child dedication and our starting strong. So uh, child dedication is something we're going to be doing on the 12th of December in our in-person service. Now we require everyone who wants to dedicate their child to be a part of our Starting Strong class that empowers parents or new parents to know how to uh, uh, approach this moment of dedication with a soberness, but also an excitement of what God wants to do. So please do sign up for our Starting Strong course that will be starting in the first week of November. And so we would love to connect you with those leaders to make sure that you are in the path in the journey of starting strong. Each session will happen on Saturdays online. So we hope that that time will work for you and your beautiful family. And lastly, I wanna let you know that we're gonna try something different next week. We are having, as part of our Proverbs series, next week we're gonna speak on wisdom in relationships. These relationships are all different, whether it be your relationship with a spouse or a friend or a child or your parents. And so what we've decided to do is that we are gonna have a panel um, where we're gonna be sharing stories of wisdom that we hope will help you at home and those who are gonna be in person to know how to navigate the beautiful realities of the relationships we have. And so what we are asking you to do is to note the following. Next week, we are gonna be live streaming our Every Nation Bryanston service from our venue. We are hoping that this will come out nicely for you, that you'll be able to hear and see. And so we are letting you know in advance that for whatever reason, if there's load shedding or whatever, that you know that we are working really hard to make sure that we get the Sunday message and the content out to you right here in your living room or your phone or wherever you're watching this from. So pray for us as we get ready for that. We are hoping that there will be no issues with the streaming, that you'll be able to come in on this platform, whether you're watching on YouTube or our church online platform, we will be right here on Sunday, same time, 10 o'clock. Um, and we hope that the stream will be able to work well so that you can connect with us. All right, uh, with that being said, we're continuing today with our Proverbs series and today, I want to talk about the proverb on happiness. Are you 
happy. Right? When, when you take stock of everything in your life, where you've been, where you are, where you're going, uh, who you've been, who you are today, and who you are becoming, are you able to look in the mirror and go, I'm happy? I'm not talking about have you achieved everything you can possibly achieve in this life. I'm not talking about having goals and, and having dreams and waking up tomorrow morning, doing the hard work you need to do, keep on pressing and keep on going. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about at the core of your being, when you process who you are, where you are, where you're going, are you happy? When you look in the mirror, are you happy? Now, if the answer to that is yes, why is that the case? What have you gained? What do you know? What have you achieved? What have you done or what has happened to you that has made you at your core happy? Now, you and I know day to day, we have all kinds of days. Some days are tougher than others. We we lose loved ones, we get promotions, we uh, 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 have a fallout with a friend and we make a new friend. I'm not talking about the variation of circumstance. I'm talking about your inner being at your core. Are you happy? Now, some of you might say, no. But I would ask you, what needs to happen? What are you waiting for? What thing needs to happen to your life or in your life? Or what do you need to gain, know, and achieve that will actually make you happy in your core? Today's message is simple. I want to speak to you today from the subject matter, the holy work of happiness. The holy work of happiness. So in order for us to have spiritually healthy, emotional lives, we we not only need to know and have the wisdom to process misery. When things are going tough, when things are a wrestle, we need to be able to know how to process the difficult things in our lives. We, we, We not only need to have something that we are living for that is beyond us or a beautiful community that is walking with us, but we also need to have the wisdom to know how to find, choose, and keep happiness and joy. Today, I want to help you do exactly that. And so we're going to look at Proverbs chapter 17, verse 22. If you have your Bibles turned there, it says this. A joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Lord, help us today as we hear your word, as we study your word. Help us to respond in obedience and in love toward you and to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. The writer of the book of Proverbs in this moment is not making a a moral observation. The writer is not saying, the one with a crushed spirit is bad, and the one with a cheerful heart is good. No. They're also not saying, the one with a crushed spirit has less faith than the one with a cheerful heart. And lastly, they are definitely not saying that the one with a crushed spirit has more favor with God than the one with a cheerful heart. No, instead, what the writer of the book of Proverbs is doing, he is making an observation. You see, he's, he's observing that when he, when he looks at people's lives, he's come to realize that the soul disposition impacts the body disposition. The soul disposition impacts the health of the body. And so he's saying that I've noticed that those with a crushed spirit, their bones are dry. There doesn't seem to be any fat in their bones. There seems to be a, a sapping away of life that has caused the dryness to the bones. But I found the cure. And the cure in a world that 
doesn't have the kind of medicine you and I have when we are going through a, a, a mental health challenge in a world that doesn't have a therapist or a, a counselor. Here's what you say. Here's what I've noticed, that those who are wrestling with a crushed spirit that has impacted their bones and impacted their bodies negatively, I found a cure for them. And the cure is a cheerful heart. A cheerful heart. It is, the cure is happiness. And so, I want to show you three places where you can go and find the cure. Three places where you can, where you can open up your cabinet and you'll be able to take out that cure, that cheerful heart that brings health and wholeness to your body. Here are the three. One is that you can find happiness in the simple things. Two, you can find happiness in the dark places. And three, you can find happiness in eternal realities. The simple things. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 24 and 25 says this. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? As I mentioned before, the book of Proverbs is meant to be read with Ecclesiastes and Job in mind, because all these three books together make up the wisdom literature in the book of the Bible. And so every now and again, when we are reading a part of Proverbs to, to uh, uh, place it and attach it to a, a verse in Ecclesiastes or Job actually helps because they all allow us to see a, a more colorful picture to make one particular point. And in this point, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you can walk away and go, I don't know, I think this guy could be a little bit depressed. But, but in this moment, in this point, though he says a lot of things in the book of Ecclesiastes that need to be understood within the context of their time, in this particular point, he says something very true. And here's what he says. That enjoyment is something that God allows us to have. The ability to enjoy God's creation, what he's created all around us, actually comes from God. But he also says that what he's found is that there's enjoyment and happiness, delight in the simple things of life, like a good meal or a, or a good glass of cold water or whatever cold beverage you love to drink. That there is enjoyment and delight and happiness when we wake up in the morning and we see the sunrise or we stay up in the afternoon and we watch the sunset, we take a walk, we are able to hang out with our loved ones or even our family and have a discussion and, and, and have a good laugh with our friends. The importance of finding joy in the simple things of life. You see, the only tension with this is that sometimes it's very hard to find and to capture and to experience the happiness that comes from the simple things of life because of this tension. We tension out what we have versus what we don't have. We tend to focus most of our lives based on the things we see, what's being marketed at us, what we're seeing on social media, what we're watching on TV. We tend to spend most of our lives focusing on the things we don't have. And because we're focusing on the things we don't have, it makes it really hard for us to enjoy the things we actually do have. This Sunday, we're going to have church. I'm actually recording this on a Thursday, and today is my birthday. Hey. Um, but this coming Sunday, when, when everybody meets together at our, at our venue, they're all going to come in different cars. 
right? Some would have traveled with a taxi. Some would have traveled in Uber. Some would have been uh, uh, taken up, picked up from home, and given a lift by somebody else. Some would have come with their own car. Maybe it's a Nissan. Some would have come in their own car. Maybe it's a Mercedes Benz or some kind of big van or whatever it is. But when they all get to the parking lot, there are some people who, when they park the car or get out of the car that they're in, they're going to look at what other people came in and they're gonna wish that they had what, what those people had. And what everybody is gonna miss, what everybody is gonna miss when they get into the room is the gratitude of the fact that they all got there. They all got to the same place safely. You see, the one with the fancy car is gonna get out and gonna wish that they had the other car that doesn't allow them to pay as much as they have to pay every single month. Uh, the one with uh, a, a simple, small car is going to wish they had a big car because now they have a family and they're looking at somebody else's car and they are just hoping, hoping, sometimes even coveting that they would have that same car. The enemy of happiness in your life when you are trying to find and, and enjoy the simple things in your life, you know what the enemy of that is? It's coveting, comparison, and competing. All of those things serve as, as enemies to us enjoying what we have. I would even include in that list complaining, right? Always feeling like, man, I should have gotten that. I deserve to get that. All those things work as enemies against. But here's what I want you to see. Rich Velotis says it like this, that we all need to Live free from the lie that having more of something makes us something more. See, one of the reasons that it's hard for us to enjoy the simple things of life is that we are moving so fast through life to try and achieve more, to try and get more, to try and supposedly be more that we can never really slow down enough to be thankful for what we have and what we've been given. This goes all the way through to the book of Genesis, by the way. God creates the world in six days, regardless of what your creation the uh, theory is. Creates the world in six days, but on the seventh day, he rests. And, and, and you, you know what he does when he rests? He, he's not just resting from work, but he's resting from work so that he might enjoy creation with the humans that he had made. Why? He made the humans on the sixth day so that the, when the human would wake up on the seventh day, they would find God not working, but God resting so that they might enjoy creation together. This is so important for us, right? That there are deliberate moments every day and every week where we need to deliberately slow things down during that meal, during that conversation, and be thankful for what we have, and be thankful for what we've been given. You see, to, to slow things down allows us to overcome the constant comparison between what we have and what we don't have. This is critical because when we slow down and we begin to be grateful for what we have, what happens? Our hearts become cheerful. And when our hearts become cheerful, the cheerful heart becomes a cure to our bodies. What could this cure be possibly healing us from? Philippians, Philippians 4 verse 11 to 13 says this. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. And in any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, I don't want to focus on verse 13, which is I can do all things through him who strengthens me, but I do want you to see 
that part of Paul being content involves him being in relationship with Christ. Part of him being content involves him depending on Christ. But the key word I want to focus on is this. Paul says, I didn't get here by quick revelation. He says, I got here by learning. I got here by constant, regular learning. Can you feel the the slowed down spirituality that allows Paul, whether he has much or he has lack, to go, I am content. For Paul to be able to find a sense of joy and happiness in his life, regardless of the circumstance, required for him to learn. To learn. This is key because ultimately what we get to figure out from Paul is this, is that when we are in Christ, when we are in in the one who is above all of creation, then we can actually enjoy creation without being attached to creation. You see, the the cheerful heart is the cure that actually cures us from being attached to the idols of this world. Marsh, who's my wife, by the way, is amazing. Arguably one of the best humans I know, to be honest. I would classify her as a good thing in my life. But you know that if I make Marsh the ultimate thing in my life, it absolutely changes the game. That that if I make Marsh a good thing that becomes an ultimate thing, if I make her the one thing that becomes everything, that eventually I become enslaved to Marsh. And and, and all of a sudden, I don't want her to go out and be with other friends because I'm afraid that I might lose her. All of a sudden, I don't want her to drive out in the middle of the night because I'm I'm afraid that she, she, she might get into a car accident. All of a sudden, I don't want to make her unhappy by disagreeing with her because I'm afraid that she might walk out of the house. What did I do? I have made a good thing into an ultimate thing and now I no longer am able to enjoy it for what it actually is. But now I begin to be enslaved to it because of what it can do for me. There is such a big difference. You see, when we're in Christ, we can enjoy creation without being attached and making an idol out of the things that God has made for us to enjoy. This is true for work. You see, sometimes we don't realize that we are living as though we ourselves are Israelites back in Egypt who were oppressed. Do you know, do you know one of the reasons why, why we know that they were oppressed? They never had opportunity to rest. They were always enslaved to work for the Egyptian empire. There was no rest for the Israelites. And one of the things we can know in our lives when we are living imprisoned by, by idols, living imprisoned by good things we've made ultimate things, that we don't know how to rest from those things. We don't know how to have an identity apart from those things. We don't know how to slow down and enjoy those things for what they actually are and not make them more than what they actually are. Enjoy the simple things in your life, but don't make them ultimate things. You see, when you enjoy the simple things in your life, a cheerful heart develops. And when the cheerful heart develops, it becomes cure, it becomes a cure to your body by doing what? By healing you, giving you the adequate medicine that allows you to not be attached and making things idols in your life. Enjoy the simple things. Take time this week to be able to, 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 to look at your spouse in the eye and tell her how amazing he or she is. Take time this week to call a friend and have a long conversation, laugh together. Take time this week that when you're having a meal, to not just be thankful, but be thankful for the fact that God has provided for you. Take time to eat in such a way that you enjoy the taste of what you're eating. Take time this week to go outside and take a long walk. 
Put away your phone. Pause your emails. Pause that show you intend on watching on Netflix and go outside and enjoy the simple things that God has given you so that you might have a cheerful heart that brings medicine to the dry bones. Secondly, we can find happiness in the dark places. Job chapter 23, verse 8 to 12. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I do not perceive him. On the left hand, when he is working, I do not behold him. He turns to the right hand, but I do not see him. But he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and have not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. Job, Job is agonizing right here. He's actually responding to God. He's gone through so much agony. And like you and I, sometimes when we go through dark times, the dark nights of our soul, when we go through tough times, it is hard to feel God. It is hard at times to know what God is doing and where God is. And Job is going, here's what I've realized, right? When I'm going forward, I can't find you. When I go backward, I can't see you. When I look to the left hand, I know you're working, but I can't perceive what you're doing. But here's what he says. But he knows, I know that you know the way I take. And when you've tried me, when you've tested me, I will come out as gold. But you know what I'm going to do in the meantime? I'm going to keep holding on to your word. I'm going to, I'm going to not depart from the commandments of your lips. I will treasure your words in my mouth more than I treasure good food. Right? Isn't that amazing? Job is saying, listen, I can't find him sometimes. I can't perceive him at times, but I know he's doing something. And so as a result, I'm going to do what I can do. I'm going to hold on to his word. How do we find happiness in dark times? Here's how. There is a tension we face in dark times between what is happening and who God is. When we focus on what is happening, It's very hard for us to not be filled with anxiety, especially when what is happening seems to be beyond the gambit of what we can control, especially when what is happening seems to be beyond our ability to fix and to fix quickly. And so the the best thing to do if we want to find joy in dark times, it's not that we ignore what is happening, but we need to train our hearts in wisdom to be aware of who God is. Because when things happen in our life that are hard to control, when life seems to go out of hand in our lives, we struggle to find his presence, we struggle to feel his presence, but we need to know who he is. That's why Job says he's gonna keep holding on to his word no matter what. You know, like, like, like a dog who's just gripped into that meat and he's refusing to let go. I'm just going to keep latching on to the words of his mouth. But here's what I want you to see. There is a gift that comes with God's absence. There is a gift that comes with God's seeming absence when we no longer can feel him and we're going through chaos and all those things. You know what that gift is? Is that we become free of following our feelings in order to experience God. Let me repeat that. 
There is a gift that comes with God's absence or God's seeming absence. Theologically, we know God is present. He is where you are right now and he is where I am right now. But can I feel him? No, I can't. Can I see him? No, I can't. But here's what I do know. That in this moment when I can't feel God, but I know that he is working and that he is present, what happens to me is that I gift I get the gift of being freed from the tyranny of my feelings. I no longer depend on my feelings to follow Jesus. Instead, I, I trust in his word to help me to follow Jesus. I trust in his character to help me to follow Jesus. You might know the scripture, James 1. Verse two to three says this, it says, count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And when perseverance has had its work in you, you will be complete, lacking nothing. What does he say? He's saying when trouble times come, when, when the dark night of the soul knocks at your door, what do you need to do? You need to consider. You need to think through. You need to be mindful of joy, of, of, that, of that happiness. Because you, you might not have the feelings to help you to overcome whatever you're doing. But what you do have is the things you can consider, who he is, what he's done, what he's promised. And as I consider those things, I consider it pure joy in the midst of the dark night of the soul. You see, normally our equation is as follows. This terrible thing is happening Therefore, it must mean God is whatever we add to that. This is happening. Therefore, God is dot, dot, dot. But what if our equation was different? What if our equation was the following? God is, therefore, I am even in what's happening. God is, therefore, I am even in the midst of what's happening. We see this not only in the Old Testament with Job, we see this in the New Testament, whether it be with Jesus, in the Garden of Gethsemane, or with Paul. I'm gonna read you a text in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And, and I, I want you to hear, I'm gonna read it slowly, I want you to hear the reality of what's happening to Paul. And then I wanna come back to this point of us finding happiness in our dark times. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 21. We'll take it from the second portion of verse 21. Here's what it says in chapter 11. But whatever anyone else dares to boast of, I'm speaking as a fool. I also dare to boast of that. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the offspring of Abraham? Well, so am I. Are they servants of Christ? I am a better one. I am talking as a madman here. With far great labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death. Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes less one. Three times. I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, Danger from false brothers in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night in hunger and thirst, often without food, 
in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Who is weak? And I am not weak. Who is made to fall? And I am not indignant. Verse 30, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my weakness. Interesting here. The, the most frequently used word in this passage is the word danger. And not once in this passage does Paul mention the name of God. And especially not once does Paul refer to feeling the presence of God in the midst of danger. It is all just this. There's a lot of things that have happened to this man that you and I would classify a man of God, following the purposes of God, loving God, sacrificing for God. And here's what it's saying. It has been crazy. It has been tough. But you want to know what I'm boasting in? I'm not boasting in my feelings. I am boasting in my weakness because what I've come to realize is that when I'm weak, he is strong. Not that when I'm weak, I have felt his strength. No. When I am weak, this is what I know of who he is. He is strong. Do you want to find happiness in dark times? Well, you can. And where you find it is in the revelation you have of who he is in the midst of what is happening. See, maybe God's seeming absence in our emotions is a gift to us to save us from the tyranny of living lives following our feelings instead of following Jesus. There is such a difference between those two things. We don't need to feel good to follow Jesus. We don't need to feel bad to follow Jesus. We need to know who he is. And when we know who he is, what happens? Even in the midst of our chaos, even in the midst, we have a reason to have a cheerful heart in dark times. Because we know that when we are weak, he is strong. We know that when we are in a dark time, he is working. We know that no matter how painful it is, no matter how much we've lost or failed, we know he is making all things beautiful in and through our lives. We're free from living in prison in our feelings. And it is this joy, this cheerful heart when we realize who he is in the midst of what is happening that is a cure to us, a cure to us, a, a, a medicine to us for the places where we live under the tyranny of our feelings. Lastly, not only do we find happiness in the simple things, but we find happiness in dark places. Not only do we find happiness in dark places, but we also find happiness in eternal realities. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13 to 18. Paul again says this. Since... We have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written. I believed and so I spoke. We also believe and so we also speak. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. For it is all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So do not lose heart. Do not let your spirit be crushed. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. 
For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient. They are temporary. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Paul is once again pointing us to a place where you and I can find happiness. And this time, the place where we can find happiness is not in the seen things. And it's not even in the things that are not felt, but it's in the unseen things. But these things are not just unseen, but they are eternal. And so Paul is calling us to not look up, but to look through. To, to look through all the realities of this present world and realize there is another world that exists in the middle of all that we are going through. And in that world, there is nothing in that world that can be changed by anything that's happening in this world. There is nothing in that world that is not permanent. Everything in that world is permanent. Therefore, when I look to that world and I see what is present and what has become my inheritance. I can find happiness even in the transient things of life, even in the temporary things of life. When I see and look in the realm of the eternal realities, I can find happiness because they are eternal, they are permanent, they cannot be affected by anything else that is happening in this world. Here's a tension, therefore, we face. We, we, we struggle to have cheerful hearts when we focus on the things that are wasting away, right? Eventually, all the money will go away. Eventually, the, the physique we have will eventually waste away. Eventually, uh, we will die. <laughs> eventually, all of us, we are going to die. The things we've accumulated in this world materially are eventually all going to waste away. Now, I hope we're going to uh, live long enough for our generations and the generations after them to experience some of the inheritance that we want to leave for them. But eventually, we all know all that we accumulate and all that we continue to hand over to the next, whatever it is, it will all eventually waste away. But when we focus on the things that waste away, our spirits are going to be crushed but when we focus on the things that cannot be taken from us, the things that are eternal, our hearts are cheerful. We can find happiness in the eternal realities of the kingdom. You see, if we have something that cannot be taken away from us, then it means we have something we can always give. Please hear me. If you have something that cannot be taken away from you, you have something you can always give. No matter the season, no matter the circumstance, no matter the difficulty or the pleasure, you can always give what you always have. And what we find is this, that what will remain forever is Christ. It's Christ. This is why in Acts chapter 8, verse 1 to 8, this is a beautiful story, last scripture I want to read for you. Here's what it says. And Saul approved of his execution. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen, and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and, and, and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Now, verse 4, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to them Christ. And the crowds with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the signs he did for unclean spirits, 
crying out with loud voices came out of many who had them and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. Verse eight, hear this, here we go. So there was much joy, there was much happiness in that city. Did you see what just happened? Here are a bunch of people who are being killed, who are being persecuted, who are being imprisoned, and who have just been scattered. Imagine for a moment that persecution started to happen right here in Joburg. Do you understand what being scattered means? It means you leave your house and your and your and your and your valuables and even your loved ones, you leave them in a rush so that you can take all the things that are important to you, and then you you go off to some kind of safe refuge. So they have to completely uproot their lives and leave behind things that they had built, saved up, achieved, things uh, that they had loved. They have to leave all of that behind and take the bare essentials and rush off to safety. Why? Because people are being killed, imprisoned, hurt, all because of their love for Christ. But what happens, right, when they scatter, they, the only people who don't scatter are the apostles, the professional Christians, if you will, the pastors, the prophets, they all have stayed behind in Jerusalem. So who goes? All the businessmen, the, the businesswomen, all the, the, the lay people who are doing all kinds of different jobs, the, the stay-at-home mom, you name it. They're the ones who've gone out there and it says that these people who've scattered, who are not the apostles, these people who scattered, start preaching Christ. Watch this. They start giving away what cannot be taken from them. That even though they've lost everything, even though they've had to uproot their lives completely, they have what no one in this world what nothing in this world, they have what death cannot take away from them, and that is Christ. And so when they go even to areas of their enemies, bear in mind, there was a racial tension between Jewish people and Samaritans. And right here in the story, a guy by the name of Philip is scattered all the way into enemy territory. He's with outsiders, people that Jewish people would look down on, would racially uh, consider them to be lesser than. When he gets to them, he gives them what cannot be taken away from him in this life and in the life to come. The eternal reality of Christ. They get that they preach Christ. They don't preach good opinions. They don't uh, uh, preach... uh, 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 Good ideas, they preach what they have, and what they have is Christ. There must be something in your life that cannot be taken away from you through pain, through hardship, through death, that cannot be taken away from you because something brand new came. No, 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 something that is permanent and eternal that cannot be taken, cannot be shaken from your life. When you have that, you always have something to give. No matter where you go, no matter who you are, even if you have to start all over again, those of you who lost everything during COVID, even if you have to start all over again, you have something. See, doesn't doesn't this remind you of Moses in the Old Testament who only had a staff and God used whatever he had in his hand? Do you realize that now because of Christ, we always have something in our hand. If you call Christ your Lord and Savior, you you always have something in your hand. We can find happiness in eternal realities. And the cheerful heart that knows that it has something that is eternal, that cheerful heart becomes a cure. What is a cure in our bodies, in our bodies that have have dry bones? What does it cure in our crushed spirit? What does it do? It cures us from fear. You see, now, because of Christ, we are able to give generously without the fear. Without that fear that, that 
promotes hoarding in our lives, without that fear that, that, that pushes us to try and gather everything just for ourselves because we might lose stuff. No, no, no. But because we know we have something that cannot be taken away, it gives us a cheerful heart and that cheerful heart gives us the cure or becomes the cure that sets us free from the deep fears of our life that cause us to hoard and control everything. I want to end with the story as we close. A couple of months ago, we had a clothing drive. We were going to be giving clothes out to uh, a shelter in Deep Slurt and another initiative that's happening uh, in the city of Johannesburg. And a whole bunch of you, thank you, brought a whole bunch of clothes. On one particular day, um, one of the homeless people close to where our church venue is saw these cars coming in and out. And so they came to the venue thinking that it was a church service. And when they got there, they asked what's going on. I told them, hey, we're doing a clothing drive or a clothes drive. And, and they said, well, I thought it was a service and I was hoping to come to church. I said, well, unfortunately, we don't have church right now. We're all online. Um, but can I, can I help you with some clothes? And he said, yes. Now, um, one of the trepidations he had was uh, he wanted to take the clothes, which I did give him, got a whole bag full of clothes. Um, but he said he needs to quickly change so he can put on himself the clothes that he likes because he doesn't know that when he finally gets to his friends, if they might not try and steal or take the clothes that he has. So he quickly changed and put on the favorite stuff he had and he left some of the stuff he came with. And one of the things he came with was uh, this little blankie here. <laughs> so he put on his new clothes and he put aside his old. Do you know what happened on the cross? <laughs> what happened on the cross is that Jesus took our old clothes. He put it himself everything all our sins all our brokenness whatever it is that we had that was separating us from God he he took it all and he put it on himself see we didn't just take off our old clothes but he put on our old clothes. You see why? So that he might completely deal with the brokenness, the bondage of our lives by, by being us on that cross, by taking on the fullness of our stuff on that cross. But you know what happened on the other hand? In the same vein, he didn't just take off his clothes, but he put his clothes on us. Now we permanently walk into the world clothed in his righteousness. We permanently walk into the world clothed in who he is. Therefore, the, the reason we are humble in our salvation is because we didn't do anything to deserve it. The reason we are confident in our salvation is because he loved us so much that he was willing to give us what he had on so that he might put on what we had on. Now, when we walk into the world, we always have a reason to be thankful because every day we put on clothes that we don't deserve. Every day, our, our naked Shameful bodies are covered by his glory. Every single day, we have something to be thankful for. Are you happy? Are you happy today? What is that thing that you are waiting for, hoping for? What is that thing that you are longing for? waiting to achieve that will make you happy. I want to propose that it's Jesus. That, that whether it's in the simple things, in the dark places, 
or even in eternal realities. For us to experience happiness in each and every one of those places, we need Christ. Because as Ecclesiastes tells us, it is God who gives us the ability to enjoy the things we have. Are you happy? Let me pray for you today and then we'll be done. Father, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you came. You came humbly. You came boldly. You came courageously, seeking, searching for us, for those who were lost, those who didn't know you, those who were enemies to you, those who were naked and homeless, those who were hungry, you came to seek and save us. And Lord, you didn't just do it, but you did it brilliantly. You did it sacrificially. You did it generously. To the point that even today, over 2,000 years later, we still look to the cross with joy in our hearts, with hearts that are filled with cheer, and happiness because the impact of a God man laying down his life has carried even to today to a young boy all the way in Tanzania. You found us, you healed us, and you put your cloak of righteousness on us that would always have something to be cheerful about. I pray for my brothers and sisters, for my friends, new and old, that, Lord, you would reveal yourself to us today in the simple, in the dark places, and in the eternal. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, guys, thank you again for taking time out uh, to be with us during the service. I hope this sermon really spoke to you personally for whatever situation you might be facing and you might be in. And uh, before we get to the blessing, I want to remind you to join a group. Be a part of a community uh, that uh, is growing in God together. And if you are not in a group, but you would love to be in a group, sign up today on the links provided so that we can connect you to our spiritual family. Hey, some of you might want to in the last month or two of the year to do our next steps class called Pathways. This empowers you to know how to know God and make him known in very practical and meaningful ways. And so I want to encourage you before this year ends, maybe take time now to click on that link and join our Pathways class. I know for a fact that these classes for me have been helpful, not just in the creation of them, but in helping people walk through them. These are some of the things that I found to be helpful as I was growing up in the Lord, and we've kind of packaged them in a way that can be uh, transferable to help anyone else who wants to take their next steps in growing in their faith. So sign up for Pathways today. That being said, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace and a little bit of happiness. Amen. Holy Spirit, move among us. Come Holy Spirit. Flow living water, flow within us, flow living water. Your love is alive, it's breaking the darkness, it's bringing the light to soften the heart of stone. Your love is alive. It's breaking the darkness, it's winning the fight, and bringing the orphan. Tando, tando, la co, la co, luya pila, luya pila, buso, buso, wa co, wa co.
A love that is active, a love that is captive to pursue in a heart that is passive. I can't explain the feeling of being loved by a love that is living and breathing, a love that never destroys. Even after I throw out a cup full of toys, but a love that always enjoys, that it employs itself to come drown out all of the noise when I'm dim or beaming boiling or steaming when I'm happy or when I'm kicking and screaming through sowing and reaping when I'm growing and weeping somehow your love is still mine for the keeping and when I'm distant when I am not receiving in that instant when I am not believing I still can't explain this feeling of being loved by a love that is living and breathing come Holy Spirit Move among us, come Holy Spirit, Wasamoy, flow living water, flow within us, flow living water. Your love is alive, it's breaking the darkness. Bringing the light to soften the heart of stone. Your love is alive. It's breaking the darkness. It's winning the fight and bringing the open. Tando, tando. 